darkness is not an affirmative force. It simply reoccupies the space vacated by the light. This is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. It should be uncomfortable for a believer to live as a hypocrite. Delivering people out of the bondage of mainstream media. And the philosophies of this world. God has called you and me to be his ambassadors. Even in this dark moment. Let's not miss our moment. And now, The Hamilton Corner. Good evening. Welcome to The Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. I'm your host, Abraham Hamilton III. And I'm so glad you have joined me for the program today. All of those people who say Lamar Jackson couldn't play quarterback. Ooh, you want to know what they're eating for Christmas dinner? Hot buttery crew stow. It's stew. That's what I meant to say. I said stew. I mean, my joke fell flex. I meant to say stew and I said stow. Sorry about that. Anyway, well, folks, you've made it to your it, on your way to the weekend edition of the Hamilton Corner. Uh, so much has happened this week. Um, but I want to take a pause on reflecting on all of those things uh, to bring some information to your attention that you may not be aware of in the realm of finances. That is coming up later on, so you definitely want to stick around for that. But before we get to all of that, let me remind you, because most of you right now are making that transition from your part-time jobs, which is what you do to generate an income for your family, to your full-time work. What you do within your family, within your home, is full-time work. Why? Because it is ministry. The first institution that God ever created was the family. In fact, the first command ever uttered by God to mankind was to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. So when you consider that family is the first institution and that the first command that God ever gave was uttered within the context of family, you begin to get a clear picture of the importance God places on family because God views family of, as of the utmost import, so should we. So I want to encourage you, just as I do on a daily basis, that as you make this transition, do it with the understanding that you, uh, if you're the head of your home, you're the high priest of your home. You know, you are uh, shepherding a family, that this is full-time ministry, that what happens in your house is far more important than what happens in the White House because we will never be able to out public policy out politic, nor would we be, will we be able to out church deficiencies in the home. And in terms of discipling the offspring of Christian families, guess whose job that is? Us as parents. The Lord instructed the parents, Christian parents, to be the ones responsible for discipling the children. Not the youth pastor, not the church, not the school. It's you and I. So let us be about our father's business, starting in Jerusalem, which is in our homes. Praise God. Well, we will do what we always do, start the program off by turning to the Word of God. Today, we're going to talk a bit about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus from Luke chapter 19, uh, verses 1 through 10. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. I know I say this a lot, but whenever I turn to the Gospel of Luke, I'm reminded uh, that Luke's occupational background was as a physician. Luke was not a, a trained theologian, you know, Luke's professional history was not that of a theologian, but nevertheless, God saw fit to call him. And as a result of having called Luke, he becomes one of the recorders of the gospel, as well as the initiation of the church age in the book of Acts from a doctor. Why are you saying that, Abraham? I'm saying that because if you are in the family of God, you have been called into ministry. Every single believer is called to ministry. In fact, this whole idea of celebrity that has often seeped its way into the church, it's an unbiblical notion because there's no big eyes or little use in the family of God. We all have value before our Lord inher inherently, intrinsically, as a result of being made in his image. And then when he places us in the body, our distinctiveness is in our function, but not in our quality before the Lord. So every single one of us has a role to play. So no matter what your no, so no matter what your occupation may be, whether you may be a domestic engineer like my wife, <laughs> whether you may be a sanitation en engineer that helps us keep our homes clean by discarding the trash, taking it to the dump sites and things of that nature, whether you may be a janitor, whether you are a CEO of a of a tra multinational corporation, every single one of us have been called into ministry. Every single one of us, and so it's incumbent upon us to submit ourselves afresh on a daily basis 
to say, Lord, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. <laughs> I place myself in your hands afresh to do what you will in my life and through my life. The Lord's desires for all of the ministry that comes through us to be the overflow of what God is doing in us. That's why I never want to be caught reading the Bible so I can come on the radio and talk. I never want to be caught reading the Bible so I can preach a sermon. I read the Bible to meet God. I read the Bible to be transformed by his word. And as a result of being transformed on a continual basis, I overflow to others. But it's about being transformed personally first. So every single one of us can be like, I talk about Epaphras and, and, and Luke and, and all of these different people. I mean, I mean, Peter and James and John, these guys, you know, were fishermen. <laughs> they were fishermen. And look what God did in and through their lives. So my, my simple encouragement with this portion and understanding that Luke is the one who is penning this gospel by the Spirit of God, uh, that his background was not a theologian. He was just a regular doctor who God chose to use. Praise God. All right, let's get into it. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. This is what the Word of God says. He, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was, a, he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him. Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. Who is the, the they? The Jews in Jericho. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Oh man, I love the word of God. So first, the first thing I want to note from this, Zacchaeus, his name actually means pure. Isn't that interesting? Zacchaeus' name means pure. Nevertheless, he found himself living in such a way to where that purity is not reflected in his lifestyle. The Bible introduces Zacchaeus to us as not just a tax collector, but as a chief tax collector. So he basically works for the Roman version of the IRS. <laughs> and he was um, regarded very derisively. They, they, they despised Zacchaeus, particularly the Jews in Jericho, because his role as a tax collector uh, caused him to be an agent of the Roman government, who the Jews viewed as an occupying force in their Israel homeland. So they viewed Zacchaeus as a traitor. And in Zacchaeus's position as a chief tax collector, it afforded him the opportunity not only to, to collect the taxes due to Rome, but he often padded what was required to be paid. And through the additional money he collected, he enriched himself. The Roman leadership, the Roman government had no problem with that as long as the Jews paid the taxes that were due. So they basically looked the other way as Zacchaeus basically was a thief, which he confirms uh, by his own admission later on in this whole process. But I'm sharing this so you have an idea of who this guy was. Small in stature, but big in grifting. <laughs> Small in stature, but big in thievery. You know, he didn't allow his uh, ethnic affinity with the Jews to cause him to be a non-thief. He's like, no, I'm, I'm. Caesar going to tax you and I'm going to tax you. And he enriched himself off this ill-gotten gain. Uh, nevertheless, he had heard about this man named Jesus and he heard Jesus was coming to town. He's like, oh, Jesus coming to town? Word. Initially, he tried to get on the route where Jesus was coming through, but he couldn't stand there because of his height. He was vertically challenged, y'all. <laughs> he was vertically challenged. Challenged. 
And so he said, nah, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go up ahead of the road where he's going to pass, and I'm going to climb into the tree because I can see him there. And in that process, he sees the Lord, but unbeknownst to Zacchaeus at this point, the Lord saw him. <laughs> it's one thing for Zacchaeus to look to see the Lord. It's a completely other when the Lord sees us. And Jesus not only saw Zacchaeus, but he stopped at that sycamore, sycamore tree to come down here because I have to stay at your house. Now, following that, <laughs> the crowd grumbles. What? This man who is performing all of these miracles, he's going into the house of a sinner? And almost contemporaneous to that statement, Zacchaeus lets out, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I'll restore it fourfold. The instance of Jesus identifying Zacchaeus and conveying to him, I see you, causes Zacchaeus to make an outward expression of something that had happened internally for him. He declares, half of my stuff I'm giving to the poor. And then on top of that, y'all know in, in Louisiana, in the bayou, we call that land yap. In the land yap, on top of me giving half of my stuff to the poor, if I have stolen, if I have uh, uh, theft, if I have defrauded anyone, I will restore it fourfold. Now listen, that is not an arbitrary declaration from Zacchaeus. If you rewind the tape back to Exodus chapter 22, verse 1, where the Lord through Moses is providing uh, the laws, not just the Ten Commandments, but the laws for, to govern the nation of Israel, the penalty for theft was fourfold repayment. So when Zacchaeus declares that he will repay whatever he's stolen fourfold, that is not just an arbitrary admission. That is him saying, I am now subjecting myself to the governorship of the Lord that should have been in place all along. I mean, my name means pure, but I have not lived up to that. But because something has happened to me inside, I now submit myself to the governing of the law of God. And that external expression is indicative of what happened inside of Zacchaeus. Why am I saying all of this? Here's the point I'm getting to. Hmm. When a person has been born again, hmm, when the spirit of God has graced an individual with repentance, there is no way to compartmentalize what God has done in your heart. In fact, when the power of sin is broken over the life of a, of a person, when the spirit of God invades to take up residence, when a person has been born again, everything about that individual is radically transformed. The Lord introduces Zacchaeus to us in scripture as a thieving tax collector. The, the narrative discussion about Zacchaeus is bookended with Zacchaeus completely topsy turvying upside downing, 180 degreeing away from his grift as a tax collector to becoming a benevolent giver and repayer of what he's stolen. If there are people that are suggesting to you that their faith in Christ is legitimate, but they found a way to compartmentalize that faith, you know, I'm one way when I'm at church, I'm another way when I'm not at church, I'm one way around this group of people. I have a completely different vernacular and manner of being when I'm around this group of people. It's hard to wear a false face when you've been born again, to say it very simply. As I say in the tagline of the show, it should be uncomfortable to be a hypocrite if you're a Christ follower. And what I'm telling you is that the evidence that is borne out in Zacchaeus' life as a result of one encounter with Jesus is an external expression of an internal reality and when the crowds the the the, the, the naysayers in the peanut gallery say oh he's going to be in the house of sinners jesus says today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of abraham he wasn't saying that for zacchaeus's benefit jesus was saying that for the benefit of the peanut gallery because though ethnically zacchaeus was a jew he for the first time as a result of of salvation coming to his house, as Jesus said. For the first time, he becomes a true son 
of Abraham. Folks, bottom line, when Jesus invades your space, he invades every space. There's no way to compartmentalize it because he gives life to every aspect of who we are. Praise God. Shining light into the darkness, this is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. And folks, I am ecstatic to have on the program with me a pioneer in the finance industry, uh, Mr. Art Alley, who is the pioneer of biblically responsible investing, the founder and president of the Timothy Plan, formerly worked at Lehman Brothers, formerly worked uh, with Prudential, and who's just uh, recently opened the New York Stock Exchange with the ringing of the opening bell, celebrating 25 years of his mutual fund company, the Timothy Plan. Mr. Alley, thank you so much for joining me on the Hamilton Corner. Abe, it is my honor. I better hang up now before I mess this thing up. So oh. Thank you for saying those nice things. Oh, no. You have to stay on because what you're doing through Timothy Plan is something that I, I, I'm praying and hoping that the Hamilton Corner listeners will hear and respond to because it's absolutely phenomenal. Would you just right off the bat introduce our listeners to exactly what Timothy Plan is? I'd be, I'd be glad to, Abe. Um, as he said, over 25 years ago, it finally occurred to me that here I am helping uh, uh, investors invest their money prudently and conservatively and doing a pretty good job at that. And, and that's when it hit me. I says, you know, I'm dealing with Christian investors, and I'm helping them invest their money uh, in, in quality companies in every other way and mutual funds without regard to what these companies are involved in. Mm. Uh, so when it, uh, I started doing the research, I mean, there's a lot of companies funding abortion and pornography, uh, promoting uh, non-traditional marriage lifestyles, whether it's a homosexual agenda or, or heterosexual mm -hmm. on uh, traditional married lifestyles, uh, anti-family entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, you know what? Uh, we really have no business investing in these companies, but nobody in the industry at that time was addressing these concerns. Mm. So uh, I went home, talked to my wife, as I've learned to do, and uh, <laughs> I've learned to do with a lot of scars for all the times I didn't, by mm. the way. Uh, she got excited, and we actually did a complete U-turn and started uh, assembling what has now become – the Timothy Plan family of mutual funds. Mm. Started with one uh, 25 years ago. We now have 12 mutual funds and four exchange-traded funds as well. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, uh, my friends on Wall Street uh, thought I was nuts. I bet they did. Uh, they said, <laughs> you cannot – well, my wife still thinks so. They uh, <laughs> said, you cannot – get good investment returns mm. and screen out investing in some of the biggest, most profitable companies in the industry. And what I told them then is what I tell them today. Obedience trumps performance every single time. Mm, that is so profound. Who, who are you obedient to? And uh, I'm saying that uh, with, you know, not a tongue in cheek. I mean it. But that doesn't mean you don't get good performance, and we've, prov we've uh, proven over these 25 years we get very competitive performance without owning companies that are absolutely contrary to our biblical worldview and mm. what they're doing beneath the radar. I want to dig into that in a second, but just, just in the event that there may be a listener who may be completely unfamiliar with the, with the realm of investments and securities, would you explain briefly what mutual funds are for the audience man as soon as i figure that out we'll be doing a bit no i'm <laughs> kidding uh I'd, I'd be glad to uh a mutual fund uh, plain and simple is simply a managed uh, um how can i say i don't want to use terms like portfolio uh, a managed um investment program where thousands of investors can invest pretty much any amount, small, large, doesn't matter, uh, into a common uh, 
uh, investment uh, professionally managed uh, fund, and uh, they each own their pro rata share of that fund, but they get professional management, they get uh, wide diversification, and uh, they have now uh, mutual funds for every conceivable investment objective anybody might have. That's why we have to have uh, so many funds, because mm -hmm. asset allocation or diversification is critical to a good investment uh, experience. Uh, so it's professionally managed. It, uh, you know, I mean, our average fund owns you know, maybe 100 different companies mm -hmm. uh, that are watched daily by our professional money management firms. We do not manage it here. We engage uh, top-tier, best-of-class money management firms mm -hmm. to manage our various uh, funds. Mm -hmm. We just do the research here, and we tell them what they cannot invest in. We don't care how good it looks to them. If, if they're violating biblical uh, principles, we will not own them. And, um, you know, it, uh, I don't know if, if your listeners know who Kevin Freeman is, but this guy knows stuff, man. I mean, mm -hmm. he's, he's an expert on world uh, finance, mm -hmm. and uh, I invited him to uh, address our quarterly trustees meeting. Hmm. Uh, here about two years ago, and he made a profound statement. He says, you know, because he is a fan of what we do, hmm. he says, if you are not carefully screening out where you are investing the money God has entrusted to you, you could inadvertently be funding your own destruction. I says, wow. <laughs> um, but, you know, why would we want to fund the enemy? Uh, you know, we've got enough battles going on right here, and it's time. But uh, the reason we launched, nobody was addressing this. So yeah. we went out there, and, and we said, you know what, we're going to do this. Yeah, and I'm and, so grateful uh, that, that, that you have. And it's, it's like a simple example is many people, many of my listeners, we, we, we complain, I complain, I advocate for the defunding of Planned Parenthood from our federal tax dollars. But many of us may not even be aware in our investment portfolios, we may be putting money into companies that are giving money to Planned Parenthood. So Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, you know, and, and I'm not saying that uh, the mutual funds out there and the competitors of us mm -hmm. uh, are doing it on purpose. But if you're right. not screening it out, you're going to end up owning those companies. Yes. And, you know, uh, American Family Association uh, does a great job on, on – uh, informing people of some of these companies you should not shop at. Hmm. Well, man, if you're not shopping at them, you ought not to own their stock either. <laughs> uh, Great but, point. You know, people with mutual funds probably in their mutual funds own like Target, yeah. for goodness sakes. Yeah. And Starbucks. Yeah. Well, we won't own them. We We just won't own them. Now, you were alluding earlier because the name of the game, when people have money that they've worked hard, they've saved in many instances, put money aside to invest for their retirement, uh, to pass down to their children. The name of the game, the thing that they seek to accomplish is performance. They want to make sure that their investments are viable, competitive investments. So you're telling me that I could have m mutual funds through the Timothy plan and I can get competitive returns on my investment? Uh, our shareholders are doing that. But, you know, that even that uh, emphasis has changed in my 40 years in this industry. Mm. When I first started, it was all about performance, performance, performance. And nobody can predict future performance, but you right. look at back, your back performance and get an idea of what you might do. Well, today that has shifted, mm. uh, and rightfully so. Um, today... Trumping performance is the concern that most investors have. Don't lose my money mm. and then get me uh, competitive performance. And we take that very seriously here. We're very conservative in the way we allow our money managers to invest. Uh, but you can do that. You don't have to. We've proven over 25 years. You do not have to get in bed with the enemy by owning shares of their stock. Uh, and you can still do very, very well if you have top-tier money managers, and we do. Mm. Now, doing a little bit of reading on you and the Timothy plan, over the last 25 years, what I have uh, in my l research is that you guys have been able to, to invest over a billion dollars in biblically responsible investing. 
Well, that's right. Uh, we crossed a billion mark a, a year and a half ago or so. And, uh, you know, we're now inching up toward uh, 1.3 billion. Wow. Uh, and, and it wasn't that way in the beginning, A, because yeah. people weren't thinking like this. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I talk to people, say, Timothy, well, what's that? Well, we do biblically or something. Well, what's that? I mean, they just didn't, you know, investments for most people that are not in the industry is just a mystery anyway. Mm hmm. But to think about not just the mystery of investing, but where is this money invested, mm -hmm. uh, that is something that was a little much in the early days for people, but they're catching on, and yeah. they're starting to understand, uh, you know, why in the world it's God's money, why would I want to invest it in companies that are absolutely undermining an unholy agenda? Absolutely, and and I made that reference to you. You guys specifically, Timothy Plan, over approaching 1.3 billion now, when really only Christians own hold at least 41 percent of the money that is invested in securities, but really only one percent of that money is invested in the biblical responsible way. So you have a, an extremely high ceiling if more Christ followers would get on board and in investing in investing their money in a biblical responsible way. Is that right? Oh, you're absolutely right, and uh, all we do is provide the platform for people to do it. Uh, and they can do it directly with us. They can go to our website, timothyplan.com, or they can ask their financial advisor. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where most of our funds are distributed, through the financial uh, advisors all over the country that care enough about their clients to ask them the question, uh, whether there's if they have any moral or ethical concerns when investing the money. If they don't, uh, Abe, there are 10,000 great mutual funds out there. Yeah. If they do have these concerns, they're stuck with us. Uh, although we do have some competitors that have uh, come along, uh, but I don't think anybody is quite as thorough as we are mm. in our total commitment. God called us. Christ is a chairman of the board. He called this into being, and we are not going to dishonor him uh, no matter what opportunities uh, may arise. I mean, we could have been a $10 billion family of funds now if we had compromised, mm. but that's not the business we're in. We're in to serve uh, our chairman, and we are not going to dishonor him in the mm. way we manage these dollars. God bless you, Art. And th this is so uh, heartening uh, for me to hear, and I'm sure it is for our, our listeners uh, because there, I'm sure there are people that are out listening right now that have been thinking and praying about, you know, I'm investing money, but I'd like to make sure that companies that honor God are able to benefit from these investments while at the same time making sure I'm a good steward over the resources God has given me and so that my, my, my money grows. And if people are out there wondering how do these corporations become these mammoth corporations, it's because they have shareholders. That's right. Part of the reason is because they have shareholders that are putting money into them. And so if you want to see biblically responsible companies grow, here's a way that they can grow. And you can own a piece of them by investing in them through organizations like uh, Timothy Plan, which and I'm, I'm just going to tell you in full disclosure, uh, my own investment uh, strategies have now been opening to Timothy Plan. And you'll be seeing uh, a transition with some of my own uh, resources into the into the Timothy plan. I want to ask you this question, uh, Mr. Alley. Sure. Uh, how did you come to the name Timothy plan for your business? Well, that was back in the beginning. You know, when I mentioned I had to go home and talk to Bonnie about this because I had a very nice financial planning practice. Mm -hmm. But and you had been doing decided, it over 18 years before you started this, right? Before. Yes, sir. Uh, and I mean, we were doing very well. And I knew that if we were to go this direction, uh, we would have to embark on R&D, research and development. Mm -hmm. And I really learned what that means. <laughs> research and development means all out go and no income. Yes. So I talked to Bonnie, and she got excited. I mean, this, this really resonated with her. I said, well, we need a name. So my wife of 58 years, 5 months, and uh, 10 days <laughs> uh, researched through some study material we had, and she came up with Timothy Plan, uh, named after First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, means uh, says that if you don't provide for your family, those of your own household, you've denied the faith worse than an unbeliever. 
Well, investing fits that. And then verse 22 of the same chapter says, avoid evil. Mm. And that brought it together for us. My goodness, avoid yeah. evil. Folks, this is this is worth your consideration. Uh, I invited Art, Mr. Alley, to join me on the program to present this to you uh, because some of you may be familiar with the idea of biblically responsible investing. Uh, Dan Celia on our network does a tremendous job of communicating this. Uh, but some of you I know for a fact are not familiar with this idea, and I wanted to make sure you were aware that you have options. You, you, we, we don't have to be beholden uh, to companies who are working against us. On one hand, we're fighting the good fight, uh, representing Christ in culture, and then on the other hand, in an effort to provide for our families and plan for our futures financially, we end up giving resources and money to the very people who are working against us. You know, with these radical well sex said. ed curriculums, these radical uh, in utero baby murder agendas, these radical uh, sexual deviancy of the homosexual and heterosexual variety, as Mr. Ali said, uh, we have options. We don't have to go that route. If you had the opportunity to um, sit down and talk to, of course, you can't individually, but right now you're able to do it corporately, to every listener out there, why would you say to them that they needed to consider uh, investing their resources biblically resp- in a biblically responsible manner? Well, it's because it's available and they do not have to compromise their values. And when they come to grips with what every Christian out there that I know would say it's God's money, Ask the question. Remember that uh, years ago it was WWJD. What would yeah. Jesus do? Well, it's his money. How mm. happy you think he is for you to invest it in, in companies that are absolutely uh, undermining the entire moral fabric of our land. You don't have to do it. Well said. Folks, timothyplan.com is the website. timothyplan.com. If you are into investing already, make sure you ask your financial advisor, hey, can we get some Timothy Plan? and the mutual fund offerings. If you are new to investing, timothyplan.com is a great place to start. We don't want to only invest for the future. We want to invest in a biblically responsible manner. Mr. Alley, thank you so much for joining me. Dave, thank you. God bless and Merry Christmas to you and all your listeners. The Hamilton Quarter Podcast and One Minute Commentaries are available at AFR.net. Back to the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner. Folks, we're talking money today, and you got options. So you don't have to go the conventional route. Uh, the Lord has provided options to us. Timothy Plan is a great option that I wholeheartedly recommend uh, for your consideration. And since we're talking about money, uh, I had a story. I've been having it all week, hadn't been able to get to it, but I wanted to share it with you because it is an extremely heartwarming story, especially during this Christmas holiday time. There's a company in uh, the Baltimore, Maryland area. The company is the St. John Properties. Uh, The head of that company is a man by the name of Edward St. John, who has a history of philanthropy. Well, they recently had their Christmas party at the end of the year, and Mr. St. John had a surprise for his 198 employees. Jeff, would you please play the audio? Now, is everyone excited about the surprise? Everybody is important in this company, and everybody performs in this company. They really do. And I gotta tell you, you're all participating in a bonus based on the number of years of $10 million. I was totally blown away when this happened. What happened tonight was magical. It is life-changing. (laughs) <laughs> it is. It's really amazing. Ed is so generous. <laughs> I steer the boat, but they're the ones that run the boat. They're the ones that make the boat go. Without the team, we are nothing. We are absolutely nothing. We were just elated tonight with the response we had from everyone. It was bringing me to tears. Very excited. Been to work here a long time, and this is, he didn't have to do what he did. It's crazy. It's life-changing. Can't thank him enough. Folks, yes. And I wish this is one of those moments where I wish I could show you the video as you're listening to this audio. So what happened, Mr. Edward St. John, the owner and founder of St. John Properties, I had his Christmas party for his company, whisked all 198 employees away to a fancy dancy 
uh, hotel to or, or, or a place where they had their party with all kind of lavish food and lavish offerings. And then each employee, 198 employees, had assigned seats. And beneath their seats, they had red envelopes. Well, the party progressed to where Mr. St. John took the stage and instructed the employees to open up their envelopes. What they learned is that Edward St. John gave his employees a Christmas bonus totaling $10 million. There was a $10 million Christmas bonus pool that was divided between the 198 employees. Each employee received a Christmas bonus. The average Christmas bonus was $50,000. The Christmas bonus was given based on number of years, tenure with the company. Every single person from the janitors to the receptionists to the real estate property brokers to the the upper level leadership in the company, each employee received a bonus. And I should have said this. I didn't say this yet, that St. John Properties is a real estate uh, development company. And they set a multi-year goal some years back to develop 20 million square feet of property over eight states. Well, 2019, the year of our Lord, 2019, St. John Properties hit their goal. Edward St. John said that I have to thank my employees. As you heard in the clip, he says, I steer the boat, but my employees are the engine. It doesn't go without them. And I just thought this was extraordinary leadership, extraordinary generosity. As one of the employees said that he didn't have to do that. His employees are paid pretty well. But he said, having reached this 20 million square feet, eight state goal, I had to celebrate and reward my employees. And so based on number of years working there, the average Christmas bonus was $50,000, $50,000. You had some employees that got Christmas bonuses of $250,000. And one, I know for a fact, got a $270,000 bonus. You heard some of the employees say, this is life changing. Some of them are paying off their mortgages, the employees. Some of them have now have funds to send their children to college. Some of them now have the opportunity to make all manner of life changing decisions. And I'm hoping some of them are going to put some of their investments in Timothy plan while we're talking about it. But isn't that amazing? Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful story? It's fantastic. You know, last time I checked, and I'm going to say this and I'm going to keep it moving. Last time I checked, I didn't see anybody in socialist countries giving out $10 million in bonuses. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. And it seems like this is a good segue. It seems like our, 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 our friends on the other side of the pond across the Atlantic in the U.K. realized socialism is not where we want to go. Oh, yes, ladies and gentlemen, just yesterday the results came in for the British parliamentary election. To where Boris Johnson, who is known as the leader of the conservative party in the UK, was pit against uh, Jeremy Corbyn, head of the Labour Party, which is the UK's communist front, really. Jeremy Corbyn is a Marxist, outright Marxist. And the conservatives in the UK have now the largest victory for conservative parliamentary seats since Margaret Thatcher was the Prime Minister of England. I'll put that one on your wall. The largest victory (laughs) since Margaret Thatcher was in leadership. And it's the lowest number of Labour Party, which is their regressive left-wing party, the lowest number of Labour Party seats since 1935. (laughs) It's pretty interesting. The main drivers for the election, two main issues. Remember a couple years back when the British citizens voted to exit the European Union and how the bureaucratic regressives worked and worked and worked to thwart the will of the British people, like Theresa May and her ilk, that allowed Boris Johnson to ascend to the prime ministership in the first place? Well, the British people have now doubled down on that because the main issue was Brexit. And the next issue was the British people wanted their leadership to respect the fact that their leaders are not their lords, but their servants. 
And if the British people said, we want out of the e European Union, then y'all take us out of the European Union. There were many people who voted against Brexit who now turned around and voted for the conservatives who are promising Brexit on the simple principle that we don't like bureaucratic elected officials acting like they're our bosses. We're their bosses. And here's the thing that just, I'm just telling you, it just, it just warms my soul. These folks re rejected Jeremy Corbyn, <laughs> who's, uh, represents the Marxist wing of British politics. The media in England for the last year and a half has been pummeling conservatism, pummeling, pummeling, pummeling conservatism in England. To yet again, kind of like here in America in 2016, the media was surprised, <gasps> shocked, shocked in the gas. I had to put my pinky out for the rest of the day. Shocked in the gas that they had no idea that the sentiment was so anti-Corbyn. They had no idea. Pip, pip. Would you like to have a sport of tea? Yes, along with my tea, I'd like to vote against the Marxist communist Jeremy Corbyn. Yes. Yes. The media had no clue that it would be such a landslide for the conservatives. You think? Many conservative pundits there said, you know why? It's because the media in England doesn't talk to anybody outside of London. Hmm, I wonder where you heard those kind of sentiments before. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn and his Labour Party thought didn't, they didn't realize how important Brexit was to the British people. <laughs> they didn't know how important it was. They thought that they could turn the election away from Brexit and focus on things like, mm, I don't know, a domestic agenda that includes taxing the rich. Where have you heard that before? A domestic agenda that in includes nationalizing industries. This is, these are the things that Jeremy Corbyn was promising. We will nationalize industry. We'll take these private companies and make them uh, government. The government will just take them over. Nationalize railroads, nationalize water companies, and give everybody in England free internet access. And focus on <laughs> the future of the National Health Service. That's Brit Britain's socialized medicine so-called universal health care. Communist health care is what it is. And the Labor Party was shocked. Oh, we had no idea that the British people didn't want this stuff. They really, really, really want to leave the European Union. Yeah! You think? That's what they voted for. So now, Boris Johnson is like, yep, I told you guys, you vote for us, vote for us, vote for the conservatives. We out of the European Union as of January 31st, 2020. That's how it's going down. And so here's the thing, <laughs> many pundits in our country were saying, ooh, because this is the first time in England's history where they had an open and out loud, proud Marxist who promised to confiscate private property, who promised to nationalize industry, who promised the full on cornucopia of, of Marxism. And so many in our country were saying, this will be a great indication of what the American election will be. But those people were expecting the Labor Party and, and, and Jeremy Corbyn to win. Not only did Corbyn lose, but he lost historically. And I'm telling you that don't let the smooth taste fool you. Something very similar is coming in 2020. That is my opinion. Because just as the British people are sick and tired of these these bureaucratic elected officials acting like somebody made them king. They said, no, you work for us. You are representatives. You are commissioned to represent what we want, not your agenda. If we voted for Donald Trump as a nation, who are you to enact the full power of a deep state and the FBI to overturn the results of an election by the American people? Oh, that's how y'all want to play it? Watch what happens in 2020. So I'm telling you, I, I look, I'm not British, but I got my pinky out today. When I get off the air, I'm going to sip some tea. And I'm going to tell my wife, please pass the biscuits. When I go to take my coat, would you please put it in the boot? That's the trunk. <laughs> Do you have any cutlery so I can cut my steak? Because a win for the conservatives in Britain, 
I'm taking that as a win for us. And I think we'll see something very similar in 2020. Moving on. Moving on. Now, by now, many of you may have heard about this this, um, horrendous attack on a kosher Jewish market in Jersey City, New Jersey, that resulted in the death of six people. You guys know it. it is my policy. I will not say the names of these murderers. But it's just, it's just amazing, man. We, we, we're so <sighs> overrun <coughs> with identity politics in our country. And I have no problem. I am not an advocate for colorblind ideology, you know, that, re- that eliminates the distinctiveness that God gives us. You know, when the Lord created plants, he gave us roses and daffodils and sunflowers and calla lilies and, and, and the wonderful variety of flowers because he's a master artist, a master creator, and allows us to appreciate the wonders presented by each. Similarly, God has given us our nations and tribes and tongues and, and all of that, but not as a reason to divide ourselves by but as a reason to look and be in awe of our God and enjoy one another. And I'm just sick and tired of people taking what God has sovereignly and masterfully done and twisting it and contorting it and perverting it for nefarious purposes. I'm sick of it. Well, immediately following, immediately following this horrendous attack in Jersey City that resulted in the death of a police officer who was a father of five. I'm a father of five. Man, that touched me in my core. Joy Hehar <laughs> on The View opened her trap to rattle this off. Please play it, Jeff. The mayor of Jersey City this morning said that he believes that this kosher Odega was targeted mm-hmm. um, a- a based on anti-Semitism. Now, none of the other law enforcement people are willing to say that yet, so I think we have to be careful about it. But if it was, um, then that makes it even more horrific yeah. um, for, this, for people to be targeted that way. And then you look at the police officer, Detective Joseph Seals, who was murdered... He's a married father of five. It's oh terrible. Oh, just and awful. it just shot in the head um, and killed. And it's just an awful, awful thing. And what did he do? Didn't he just walk up to the car? He, 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 walked, up to, he walked up to this The police are always on the front line. And they, it's and a they, very and they serious job. It's a really terrible thing. Yeah. And, and we need to pray for this detective's family. Yeah. Those five children lost oh, their dad. Okay. Yes. Yeah. You, will, you will concede that uh, the nationals, so these white nationalists have been let out of their holes. Well, Joy, you probably shouldn't have popped off before you got the facts, because it turns out the murderers were two people that w- with ties or indications and leanings to the black Hebrew Israelite cult. And Rashida Tlaib had to delete her tweet because she popped off before she had the facts, too. I'm sick of this craziness, guys. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American Family Radio.